Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this discussion with Congresswoman Teresa Ledger Fernandez, the very first Yale Latina or Latino to be elected to Congress. We are so honored to feature her tonight, and we're so thankful to her, her staff, and to everyone who made this event possible. My name is Yvette Solis Rivers. I'm Yale College, class of 96, president of the Yale Club of Washington, DC, and co-leader of the First Gen Yale DC chapter. And I just wanted to thank so much all of the individuals and all of the Yale alumni organizations who work together rapidly to organize and spread the word about this event. The Yale Association of New Mexico, First Gen Yale, the Yale Latino Alumni Network, Native American Yale alumni, Yale Women, and the Yale Club of Washington, D.C. all collaborated to spread the news to as many Yaleys as possible. And we are so excited to have 290 registrants, 80% of which are Yale College grads, 18% of which are graduates of the GNP schools, 10% are current students, and from 22 states and DC and Puerto Rico, as well as seven different countries, including Afghanistan and Korea. Thank you so much to everyone who make this happen. So tonight we get to hear from Congresswoman Teresa Ledger Fernandez, hear about her journey and get to ask her questions about her experiences later in the program. But first I would like to introduce to you the woman who initiated this whole event, Marla Grossman, class of 90. She's in the DC area and is chair of the Yale Alumni Fund Board of Directors. Uh, it all started a little bit more than a week ago when Marla reached out to Lisa Chapman, the head of First Gen Yale, um, just to get some uh, assistance in, in collaborating with various Yale alumni groups to make this event possible. So thank you, Marla, for initiating this and for reaching out to everyone. Um, would you just share a little bit about your um, inspiration and what led you to initiate this event? I'm Marla Grossman. I'm chair of the Yale Alumni Fund Board of Directors. In my day job, I'm a lobbyist here in Washington, DC, helping clients before Congress and the administration. And that's where I learned that this amazing Yaley was running for Congress. And we are so excited that Teresa Ledger Fernandez is now a member of Congress. And I wanted to help introduce her to the rest of the Yale community. I'd like to put in a quick plug though for volunteering with the Yale Alumni Fund, which as you know, raises money for immediate school needs like student financial aid, safety net funds for students, and helping with the Yale uh, community and the New Haven community. This February 8th, we're gonna be opening up our board of directors meeting to everybody. We will be announcing our DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion expectations, because we really want the alumni fund to be a place where everybody belongs and everybody sees it as a home for providing service to Yale and making sure that future generations have an opportunity to attend this wonderful institution that is so dear to us. If you're already an alumni fund volunteer or a YAA delegate, we hope you'll join us for the February 8th meeting. If you're not already but interested in joining, you can just uh, do a chat sidebar, let me know, and we'll make sure that you get to attend the board meeting. And now I would like to introduce you to Michelle Mayorga, class of 2003. She has been working with the congressman from the very beginning of her candidacy, and she will share briefly her experience helping the congresswoman get elected before we then turn it over to the congresswoman. So Michelle, take it away. Hi, hi everybody. Um, again, my name is Michelle Mayorga. I am Teresa's pollster and also a Yale graduate from the class of 2003. Um, they asked me to speak tonight a little bit about um, my work with Teresa and how, you know, going to Yale um, affected that. And uh, and I immediately thought of um, my first conversation with Teresa. So let me just start from the beginning. Uh, going to Yale changed my life. It took me from um, a kid who went to public school and was raised by a single mother to somebody who people believed had potential. 
um, a guidance counselor in my high school, despite the fact that I was valedictorian, told me that the Yale application did not come in Spanish. And so when I heard that Teresa wanted to run for Congress, that there was a woman with a story like mine running, I was in before I met her. <laughs> um, and then when I met her, we met in um, a coffee shop in Albuquerque. And one of the first things that we talked about was going to Yale. And Teresa said to me, going to Yale changed my life. And I knew in that moment that this was a chance to make history. I'm sorry, I'm like ruining this. <laughs> um, but in order to make history, we had to win the election. <laughs> uh, and so we were up against pretty steep odds. Um, we had a opponent who not only was a celebrity, but outspent us. Um, and we really chose to, to stick to our truth and talk about Tedessa's connection to uh, the culture and people of the district, talk about the understanding of Northern New Mexico needs from our government, and we won. Um, and so Teresa represents a lot of firsts. She is the first Latina or Latina from Yale in Congress. She is the first woman and first Latina to represent her district. Um, but I guess the one thing I wanted to say, um, you know, before <laughs> Teresa is that it is incumbent on all of us to make sure that she is absolutely not the last. Thank you so much, Michelle. We are just so pleased that you could join us tonight and really just humbled that, that you shared your honesty and shared your passion and your emotions with us. We are just so glad that you could be with us tonight. And now it is my honor to introduce Congresswoman Ledger Fernandez. The Congresswoman was elected to represent the third congressional district of New Mexico. She was born in New Mexico. Her mother was a bilingual educator and her father served as a member of the New Mexico Senate. The Congresswoman graduated from Yale in 82 and she also graduated from Stanford Law School. She was a White House fellow during the Clinton administration. And for years after that, she ran a law firm that focused on community development, tribal advocacy, civil rights and social justice. The Congresswoman was recently elected to be the freshman representative for the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. Congresswoman, we are so proud of you and just so happy that you could join us tonight. Please everyone join me in welcoming Congresswoman Leisure Fernandez. Now I have to make sure I am mute. Can everybody hear <laughs> So thank you so much for that introduction. You know, Michelle, I always say that we only, um, we only get emotional about what we love and that we should have a whole lot of our emotion in our lives all the time, right? Because we should love so deeply and care so deeply about not just um, about our own experiences and how those affect the greater, you know, you know, the greater world around us. And so I spend a whole lot of my time tearing up because there is such beauty around us and also such pain that we need to address. So, you know, I'm with Michelle, I'm just crying all the time because I care about so much, you care so deeply. You know, Yvette, Marla, Michelle, the Yale Association, the, uh, the, these amazing diverse associations of Yale that came together to host me, I'm really grateful because you all represent something unique and you represent what I loved about Yale, right? Was that there could be, we're all Yaleys, right? But we're constantly organizing ourselves in different colleges and different associations and different majors and all kinds of different ways, but we all saw ourselves together somehow, right? And in some ways, that's how I see the world and that's how I see the United States and that's how I see the diversity that we have in this beautiful place that we call America, this beautiful place that we call home, you know, our planet Earth, and, and that we really just need to get to like where Yale is at, where you can be Davenport, you could be, you know, uh, somewhere else, but we're still Yaleys, right? Imagine if we did that. Um, so... Uh, many of you have been with me on this journey from the beginning. I need to give a shout out to, I see Mayra is on the phone, did we, I mean, is on the call. That beautiful photo of hers on the uh, cover of the Yale Magazine. I decided to run for Congress 
as I was catching a flight to go to the Yale Mecha 50 year reunion <laughs> and Maida was there, it's like, Maida, I think I'm gonna run for Congress. <laughs> and so with her and some other Yaleys, you know, we began this process. Um, so, you know, I did grow up in, uh, in Northern New Mexico uh, in, in a place where you wouldn't expect uh, somebody to head to Yale. Uh, it was a big, large rural ranching and farming family. Um, and there was a lot of discrimination and bigotry um, in that area. And uh, my father used to tell us stories about when they would take the cattle uh, to the market and they couldn't go into restaurants because no Mexicans or dogs were allowed, right? And my mother um, would tell us the stories of being punished for speaking Spanish on the playground, even though the New Mexico constitution protects the speaking and the education of Spanish because, right, we were part of Spain. I'm a 17th generation New Mexico on my European side and who knows what, because we're all a, a little bit of everything here. So they taught me a lot in the sense that what you do with bigotry and racism is you don't internalize it. You don't get angry. You just start solving problems, right? They were the pioneers of bilingual education. They passed the very first law that said that you must teach Tewa, Towa, Tewa, you know, Kara, Zuni, Apache, Navajo, and Spanish in our schools. So I grew up with this really beautiful appreciation about cultural culture and cultural diversity. And that was actually part of my Yale uh, application was about this joy that I find in cultural expression and cultural diversity. Cause I used to sing in a, you know, we were the West Side singers but we were really singing a lot of old Nuevo Mexicano songs. Um, but, you know, I, I was, uh, but I got to Yale and uh, it was such a different place uh, than where I'd come from. Uh, where I'd come from, they didn't even give the the uh, uh, they didn't even give the test uh, at the time. Only the SAT was taken at Yale, and they didn't give the SAT in my college because you didn't we didn't go to those kinds of schools, right? So I stayed out a year so I could take the SAT, so I could apply to this place that somebody who had gone there before had met me and said you should go to Yale. It's like what is that? And he told me, and I went, well, I think I should do that. And so I did, you know, I was very lucky. I scored very well. And so I, I, I got there not knowing anything. And it did, it changed my life. Um, and it made me, it taught me lots of lessons. A big lesson it taught me was to ask for help uh, because, um, you know, I just wasn't prepared. Let's face it, I was an affirmative action kid. Uh, I didn't have the kind of high school preparation uh, to succeed at Yale, but I was smart, right? Uh, and that's what, Yale recognized it's like, let's get these smart kids from different places that normally don't come here. Uh, and then let's give them help. So like, uh, I, I sometimes tell the story, people ask me, well, what, what, how did, what happened at Yale to give us some Yale lessons? And one of them is that ask for help. So my very first paper I had to write, I hadn't written much in high school. So you guys had tutoring. So I got the tutors, you know, I had a great idea. It was about Borges, you know, the idea of the labyrintho, right? But I wanted to take that metaphor and apply it to Latin American history. And so I wrote this paper and, you know, I got help about not using passive verbs and, you know, you know, helping me, recon you know, fix some of my, my errors. And so I handed it in and the professor came to give it back to us. And he gave everybody back their paper but me. And I was just like, it was like, oh my God, I failed. And he goes, I need to see, you know, Teresa, you need to stay afterwards and I'll give you a paper then. And, you know, he's, you know, I stayed afterwards and I was sick to my stomach. I was nauseous. I was going to faint. Um, and he handed me the paper and said, you know, I'm putting your paper up for this prize because it's so good. <laughs> I did not hear a thing he said. I just took my paper. I remember him saying something and I went home and kind of fell apart. Uh, but uh, it was, you know, is that it was, if I hadn't gotten the tutoring to help, I would have never, you know, been able to succeed like that. And, but it was just over and over, right? The lessons I learned, I learned to be challenged. Uh, there was somebody who was an upperclassman, I was at Davenport, who just thought I was this radical person. And I actually, probably am radical, right, by some standards, but I realized I had to learn to defend 
what he thought I believed in. And so I had to actually figure out what I believed in and then figure out how to defend it. Um, and, you know, we were uh, ideologically at different spectrums, but I think we really appreciated each other because he taught me how to look, know what I believe in and then know how to defend it and then be able to have that friendship and those sparring with people that I didn't know, right? That um, I'm sorry, with people that I learned to love, but that I didn't always agree with on a uh, political philosophy point of view. And I think that that's invaluable, right? That, that you learn that at Yale, you learn about having friendships and uh, being challenged and rising to that challenge. So Yale was great. I, I was able to have a lot of leadership opportunities there. I did a lot with Mecha Movimiento Estudiantil Chicanos de Asan and with CSPES, which was the uh, Central American organizations, uh, you know, about some of the uh, human rights crises and, you know, different issues. I was able to bring to Yale uh, people like Rudolfo Anaya, who we just lost, but he was our first like Chicano Latino novelist, right? And so we, you know, we were exposed to the Yale community, this idea of novels about the Chicano experience in the Southwest, which was new and people came to hear it. Uh, I invited Cesar Chavez uh, to come and speak at Yale. And, um, you know, we had such a response to Cesar Chavez that we filled up, um, you know, we filled up the big hall, right? And they, everybody got to hear about this amazing man um, who changed how we think about farm workers and how we think about those who pick our foods. And, and now we think about it now, right? Fast forward, those are our essential workers, right? That we don't think about. And that right now our COVID relief bills don't apply to our immigrants. And so that's something I'm working on in Congress now is to say, no, now that we have a Biden presidency and we have a Senate by the slimmest majorities, we're gonna make sure that those COVID relief apply to those, to the immigrants who are picking our foods who are essential workers. And that's something, right? That tie, as you go through the decades and you go through who you are in your past, you know, we're all tied together by what we've done and the lessons we've learned. And that's like a lesson that's coming from, you know, when Cesar Chavez came to Yale. So after Yale, I did graduate and I ended up going to Stanford. And at Stanford, I was trained as a rebellious attorney. And the best thing a rebellious uh, attorney can do is listen. And so I spent a, a good 30 years listening to my communities in New Mexico, representing them on a range of issues. And I loved all of that. I, I, I had such a, such a fulfilling um, legal practice, a very non-traditional legal practice, but incredibly fulfilling. And I would go to DC and you know, I went to the fallows and it was like, oh, I can't stay here because I, I miss my New Mexico so much. And so, because New Mexico is really my heart. And so the same thing when I went to Stanford, I, it's like I almost stayed and you know, I couldn't stay there because I couldn't stay in the Bay Area despite all the wonderful things that are happening there because New Mexico, you know, era mi alma, you know, it was my soul and I had to come back here. So when this opportunity came up, uh, of running for office, um, I, I actually answered the call, right? I felt like there were the first time in my life I had these wonderful opportunities that this was the first time though that I felt I did not have a choice, that I had to run for this office, that New Mexico needed somebody who understood it and understood its communities well and had worked in the trenches, had created opportunity in places of poverty, because that's what I've been doing. Because the places of poverty in New Mexico, there are so many, we are 50th in way too many bad indices, you know, um, childhood poverty, uh, hunger, uh, education attainment. But we also are a beautiful place. We have this strong cultural traditions, whether they're Native American, Latino, Anglo, ranching, you know, it's just a beautiful, beautiful place with these strong traditions. So our poverty also feels different. There's not the anger that is there, um, uh, but there is the need to address it and to address it in these places that, you know, are really strong in so many other, other areas. Um, and so I, so I answered that call and put together this amazing team. And my theme was protecting what we love um, because I, because I love our democracy. I've done voting rights, access to the ballot, um, fighting gerrymandering, 
bringing the Supreme Court case in New Mexico that established ranked choice voting, because I recognize that democracy is the key to who we are, our self-determination, our ability to realize whether it's in a city, in a state, in a country, you know, what we want to be. And, um, and so protecting what we love is protecting this democracy, but protecting our planet, uh, because New Mexico is beautiful for those of you. Many of I see on the call here are, are from here and we know the beauty we've chose, we were from here or we've chosen to come here because we understand its beauty, but we are at the front line of, if we don't address climate change, this beautiful place we call home won't look like this and we won't be able to live here any longer. Uh, addressing those issues of poverty, of racial inequity, uh, of economic inequity. I mean, they meant a lot. And it was wonderful because the response that we got to it, to this message of acting from a place of love, of what does it look like if policies were enacted from a place of love and of caring for the community, they resonated, right? Uh, so even though I was running against somebody who was famous and could raise a lot of money and had amazing commercials and other elected officials, I would never run for office, there was such a resounding support for this that um, I won uh, with the, you know, the next closest person was 20 points behind me, right, in the primary. And then I, I also handily won the, the general election. And this concept of protecting what we love and being a protector, uh, not always a fighter, but a protector. A protector is somebody who's very strong, right? Because you want to protect the way a mama bear would want to protect her cubs. If you think about the fierceness of that, that is what I'm talking about because that love is such a powerful emotion of wanting to protect what you love. I was having a conversation with the speaker about this idea of being protectors. Uh, she, uh, you know, when you think about that picture, when she's walking back, when she's walking back from the siege where they were looking for her, they were hunting her. You might not have noticed, but she was walking with her grandson. And I had my sons with me that week too. And uh, I had my youngest son had stayed with me and was still with me that day. And we had met her grandson, you know, getting lunch and having conversations. And I realized that she loves the institution of the democracy. She loves that institution of Congress. But she had with her somebody who she probably did never intended to expose to such risk. Um, and so I use that concept of, you know, protecting what we love and my mama bear idea. She goes, well, I actually use the lioness right? <laughs> because I tell people because it's like, don't mess with the cubs, right? Uh, and the cubs in her mind are the children. The cubs in my mind are indeed the children. It's the planet, it's the democracy, it's all of that. And so that's when I use that term of protector, that's like what I uh, am trying to, to evoke, uh, something that is both um, strong and, and, and caring and cries, uh, but, but, but acts, you know, does, does not hold back when, when, we need to, when we need to care for what, we, for what we love. And it's the idea of also not just care, protecting it, but whenever you love something, and you know it's in pain, you don't want to just protect it from the pain, you want it to thrive. Um, and so that's a lot of the policies that I think I'm going to get to work on now in Congress, is this idea of what do we need to thrive? And we have gone through hell, right? Not just the last four years, but then exacerbated with the year of the COVID. And then, you know, the last two months for our democracy was attacked and attacked and attacked. And then it was actually physically and violently attacked. You know, and that was my third day on the job uh, when we had the insurrection. Um, so my first Wednesday on the job uh, was the insurrection and the siege and the violence. My second Wednesday on the job was the impeachment because without the impeachment, that was the idea that without accountability, you cannot heal and you don't have unity. Unity doesn't just happen by saying, oh, let's have a unity. No, you need accountability. So that darkness of the siege and the insurrection, the accountability of the second Wednesday, and then that third Wednesday was the inauguration. 
And there was something about that sun coming out for those of you who, you know, we were sitting there and it was snowing on us at one moment and the Lady Gaga gets up to sing and the sun comes out and the sun shines on it. And then that beautiful, you know, everything was about this idea of acknowledging what had happened acknowledging the darkness, but saying, we're gonna to go to this light, right? And then ending it with that poem that actually tells us about seeking that light if we want, if we can only be it, right? Um, and that's where we're at, I think, is this idea of what do we need to come out to address the pain that we are in and get to a place where we can thrive and get to that transformative, that transformative moment that this moment in history demands that we either transform where we're at or, or, or we're gonna see a repeat of the last four years, right? That we've had such inequality happen and that we've had such an attack on our democracy that we need to deliver. And that I think that those I am now working with, um, my colleagues in the Democratic Caucus, um, you know, my, my incoming class that I'm coming in with, which includes Carolyn Bordeaux, which is uh, uh, another Yaley woman. Then we have Katie Porter. We have quite a great representative of uh, Yaley women uh, right now. Uh, but I think that's where we're gonna head. Um, and I feel it strongly and we feel so dedicated, rededicated and strengthened in our, strengthened in our dedication to this idea of delivering uh, what America we, needs right now to have unity of Americans coming together, right? In terms of thinking that we are in this together and that we need to care for each other and that that is how we come out of this. So with that, I'll leave at, sort of end here so that we can have a bit more of discussion uh, and I can answer some questions. Well, Congresswoman, thank you so much. I mean, so much of what you said really resonated with me, I'm sure to everyone, but protecting what we love, that's so powerful. Um, and and your, 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 your comments about, you know, getting to Yale and how you felt at Yale, I know resonate with a lot of us, particularly on the first gen side. So thank you for sharing that just wonderful story. Um, so we have some questions that are coming in in the chat and we received questions in advance. And so I'll probably go back and forth, but um, the first person I'd like to call on and like to get um, help with our team to unmute uh, Valerie. Valerie had a question for you that we'd love to have you come on screen, Valerie, unmute yourself. Hi. Or Valent Valentina, there you go. Nice. It's so nice to meet you. My name is Valentina Guerrero. I'm a recent graduate. Um, thank you for speaking with us today. I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about your decision to run for Congress. What, when did you realize that you wanted to run and what reflections, realizations and moments along the journey brought you to that decision? Thank you. So uh, Ben Ray Lujan, who was our congressperson representing the third congressional district, uh, called my brother. <laughs> my brother, was, this, this is the true story. He called my brother. My brother was the uh, chair of the Democratic Party of northern New Mexico, this rural county. My brother hung up the phone and he picked it up and he called me. <laughs> so, so it truly was answering a call and it was actually a call. And, uh, and I was sort of like, Oh, you know, and you sort of thought about it and I didn't really think about it. You know, I just was like, oh, I'm Martin, you know, and, uh, and, but I needed to decide. I really realized that, no, this is something I should do. There were some weird things that happened. My father, my, uh, I was looking at my father passed and he had a saying that was, Ores cuando, which is a response to, there's a, a, a song in Northern New Mexico about, Oh, you know, you ask politicians and they never, so they never deliver, they never deliver. And there's this refrain that goes, pres cuando, pres cuando. So my father's was, oh, res cuando, when he wanted to do something big. So that literally my father's pamphlet happened to be out on the table and, you know, with his, oh, res cuando. And so I spent four days deciding because I needed to get in to let people know I was in. Um, because the environmental community wanted me to get in, you know, some progressive communities wanted me to get in. And so I needed to let, because then if I was in, then they were like, okay, we got, we got somebody who reflects New Mexico or understands these issues so that that would signal people that Teresa's in, we're good, right? We've got somebody. But I had to actually go talk to the people I worked with. I worked with Native American tribes and leaders. And it meant that people I've worked with for 30 years, for 20 years, for eight years who've trusted me, 
who I have been part of their team that I'd be leaving them, you know, and they have taught me so much that I wanted to make sure I talked to them. I talked to my family, um, made sure my kids were all right. And, you know, the, you know, they were, and one of the tribal leaders said, Teresa, sometimes destiny asks you to do something and it's placed before you. And you need to answer that by first listening to your heart. And so, you know, they did some blessing and we got quiet and I literally, you know, we started crying because I said, my heart tells me I need to do this. And my heart tells me it's going to be really, really hard. And it's going to be really hard to not be with you anymore. And so there was a little bit of tears. <laughs> and um, so, uh, so that's, and th so then I jumped in and then it was like, like I said, I was getting on the plane to go to this Yale Chicano reunion and I was making calls and, you know, I got on the plane and there was somebody that I knew on the plane. It's like, hey, I'm running for office. And he goes, I'll help you out. Call me up. I'll give you a donation. <laughs> so, you know, so then, you know, you have to figure out, can I raise the money? Can I do this? And, you know, it happens really quickly. Uh, but like I said, I ran into Mayra and I ran into some other Latinos there who were like, yeah, we'll help you out, you know, and, and it's hard. It's Anybody who wants to consider it, it is not, it's a bad financial decision. You know, I, my firm was finally going to be incredibly successful and I'm, you know, moving away from it. It's hard on your family. It's hard on your back. You know, there's lots of ways in which it's hard. And in other ways, as crazy as it's been, it is so rewarding. The idea that I could sit in a meeting of the house, Ed and Labor, and talk about Title I schools in New Mexico and how we have fallen so far behind. Um, you know, children in Title I schools, everyone who doesn't know what Title I school are those who have high poverty rates. We have a lot of those in New Mexico. I raised the idea of Title I schools and how far our children are falling behind. The average is six months of the learning loss in Title I schools, which are Latino, uh, Black students, Native American students, the learning loss is twice as high, 12 months had that conversation. Me and the chair are now co-leading a bill that would put $65 billion into Title I schools to help with learning recovery. You know, that's the kind of thing that you can have happen when you sit in Congress. Whether we'll get it through, I don't know, but we'll get some of that through because, you know, who I'm doing it with and who I had that conversation with. Uh, so we'll get a good portion, I think, of that $65 billion going to the poorest schools in the country. Well, thank you so much, Congresswoman. We So we did have a couple of questions that I wanted, well, a lot of questions in the, the earlier submissions just about, and you've started to address this, but um, what are your legislative priorities for your first year in Congress? Um, and per, uh, just to call out the person who asked the question, Audrey Shepard and Glenn Prickett asked similar questions. What are your impressions of being in the U.S. House so far? So, uh, so my priorities, you know, Everything changed once we got, we had COVID, right? Um, um, so when I started running, you know, I was talking about certain issues, but in some ways everything changed and everything didn't. Because what happened with COVID is it hit disproportionately those communities that were the most vulnerable, right? And so I talk about the fact that in New Mexico, Native American communities have been the most ravaged. Um, I've lost people I admired and worked with. Um, I mean, the pain has been hard, but they're also the communities that suffer because they didn't have access to the internet. They don't have good access to healthcare. They don't have clean water. You know, they sit below coal burning plants. They sit, their, their lungs are ravaged because there's been uranium mining. So the reasons that we needed to address all those things before, what COVID did was say, look at what happens when you don't address it, right? That's what happened with COVID. It, it shone the light on our failures. And so in some reasons, I wanna address those same things now that we need to address those underlying weaknesses, those structural weaknesses that we have from education to healthcare to the planet. So those are the same things I wanna work on now. I've been told if you wanna work on three or four things, you're good in the Congress. If you wanna work on five or 10, go to the Senate. If you wanna work on everything, you should run for president. So I need a focus. And I'm gonna focus on those things that are, um, are in the committees that I'm working on. So on 
uh, climate issues will be a big issue. Equity issues will be big. Education issues, because that is how you that is how you turn something around. A fun thing I'm working on that we're doing a bill um, is a, a WPA for this moment, right? That's how we came out of the last uh, the last depression. We had that WPA, uh, but in New Mexico, one in ten uh, people who get a paycheck or revenue, right, is in the creative industry. And so I wanna make sure that we include that in our COVID relief. So I'm gonna have a, a WPA for our creative economy uh, because that's one in 10 and it's lots of places. And also when you think about what will help us understand each other, think about what came out of WPA, right? Those beautiful photographs. Um, the, you know, gathering at the Smithsonian of both Northern New Mexico, Norteño music, and, you know, some of the beautiful music coming out of Appalachia's. And, you know, there are ways that all those beautiful murals we see in the, in the post offices from that era, right? So there are, you know, there are ways of using culture to help with that healing. And so that's one of my fun, you know, that's one of my, I call it more fun uh, pieces of legislation that I want to see if we can get some uh, set asides to make sure we do some cultural work, even as we're coming out of um, um, the COVID. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so Bruce is the next person um, who we've been identified through the chat has me a question. So uh, Bruce, can you unmute yourself and ask the Congresswoman a question or sure. two? <laughs> I, I was very impressed when you said you would had been on the President's Advisory Council for historic preservation. And I wondered if you'd comment a little bit about how, uh, how strong those regulations are. And in your opinion, were they doing a good job protecting cultural uh, resources and historic landscapes, for example? They are not strong enough. Uh, so one of the things I do wanna take up, it's probably gonna be a longer, uh, you, know, you know, there are things we need to do right now because of to, to address the pandemic and the economic right. disaster we're in. But I do wanna address strengthening the Historic Preservation Act. Um, the, I was on, uh, I was vice chair when we had Standing Rock, right? And everybody knows Standing Rock. And the ACHP, we sent a letter to the Army Corps of Engineers saying, don't issue that permit. Um, there hasn't been adequate consultation and there's likely to be harm to cultural sites. They ignored us, <laughs> which they had the right to do, right? And so then we had the protest, then we had the mess, and then the Obama administration said, wait a minute, what are we doing here, right? And they looked in and then they withdrew that permit. Um, and But then it was so late in the game that then we had the election and when Trump came in, he said, he fast-tracked that, right? So we need to put more teeth into uh, the Historic Preservation Act, uh, more teeth into, in fact, all of the environmental laws, uh, I think, and we need to actually uh, put more teeth into them on a statutory basis so they are not as dependent on regulation. We saw what can happen to like the Clean Water Act where by regulation in New Mexico, uh, the regulatory changes that Trump did, but we will undo, basically eliminated clean water protections for like 95% of our waters. So we need a, Congress needs to take back some of its own power and not have everything be a left for agency, but actually be enacted and into law. So, uh, so I'd make them stronger. Thank you so much. All right. Um, let's see. So I'd like to call on if it's possible, Barb Picasso. Um, uh, admin, can you um, use a bar to ask a question? Hi. Hi. Good. So good to talk with you. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, so my question is that there's often the challenge of having to be wealthy enough to devote resources and time to run for office. Um, especially if you're a woman. And often that is a barrier to diversity. Do you see that? And um, what are you doing to help tackle that challenge for others? That, it, it is true. I mean, it's hard to run because you have to uh, give up. And especially I'm, I'm um, 
I'm, I'm a financially a single mom to three sons in college, <laughs> three sons in college. So this was like a really bad financial decision because there was nobody else. So you, you end up, and I've talked to other women who run you, you use your savings, you use other things because you can't work full time, right? Um, and, and, and that is a problem. Uh, now, with regards to raising funds, the great thing is, I mean, I, I, I announced my candidacy and I went from Yale. Actually, while I was at Yale on that reunion, I was calling Emily's List. And, um, and then I ended up getting the endorsement of Emily's List pretty quickly, which was really wonderful because there were other women in the race, uh, but they, they came out and said, we want somebody who understands the community. Uh, you know, and that was really big. So that really helped me raise money. Once Emily's List came in, I, I was endorsed by Bold Pack, which is the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, which was also another bold and courageous endorsement because there were other Latinos in the race. But both of those saw that I kind of, you know, was the, a great candidate for each of those and, and could win. Um, and so there are, are there are groups and entities, you know, Latino Victory that Mayra is part of. Uh, lots of other groups came in and said she has the kind of passion and community connections that we want. And so that helps raise the money. It turns out the studies have shown that if women are on the ticket, they win just as often as men. The issue is to get them on that ballot. And that's the hard part. Um, to be able to get them on that ballot and be able to get them into that general election. Um, so I will be helping, you know, I'm, I'm quickly, even after I won the primary, I started helping and raising money for others because I had, my, my biggest race was the primary. So I was helping a lot of other Latinas who were running in the general. Unfortunately, none of them won. We were the mighty mujeres, <laughs> you know, and so we, I was raising money for them. We were, you know, doing things together, helping each other out. But if somebody is interested in running, there are resources. So that, you know, that's what you're seeing now, like among my freshman class, you know, there's teachers, there's housing organizers, you know, there are people who are from community who are, are running and winning and getting the help. Now you have to, Michelle started out saying that I was outweighed probably almost double, not quite double. So you have to then be really smart about what you're talking about so that you resonate with the communities. And if you do that, you can win even if you're outspent. Wow. Thank you, Congresswoman. Okay, um, next up is Elvira. Elvira, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure. Hi, Teresa. Hello, uh, Elvira. Elvira. Congratulations. Uh, Teresa actually hosted a little uh, Yale Latino get together in Santa Fe a number of years back that I attended while I was there. Um, oh. So I had just a question about what, how, what your thoughts are on the blooming film industry in New Mexico, because, you know, it's great, but that brings on, you know, environmental issues and a few other things that could be connected with work that you're going to be doing in Congress. So I am really excited about the uh, uh, film industry because the film industry is a lot less environmentally toxic than the oil and gas industry. And we in New Mexico rely about, you know, the numbers change, but maybe it's about 30% of our budget, of our state budget can come from oil and gas. Uh, and, uh, and we're going to need to move away from that because, you know, we're not going to be able to protect this beautiful place we call home if less we transition away from oil and gas. So we need to um, transition away from that by, by really diversifying our economy. Uh, oil, the film industry is one way we need to, um, and it is also a way that has good union jobs. Uh, those film jobs are union jobs. And so we wanna do the same, like when we're pushing for renewable energy, we wanna make sure that they're good jobs, that they're you know, union jobs if possible so that they're paying good wages as we transition. Um, so uh, New Mexico is just gonna have to diversify a lot. And this is an issue wherever you're from in the United States that we all should be concerned about that there are places that in essence I call that fueled America, right? Appalachian coal fueled America. Um, New Mexico's uh, uranium you know, uh, mines fueled our nuclear plants and you know, 
the bomb, right? It's problematic, but we have a lot of leftover uranium that is contaminating people's uh, water and, and, and we have a lot of problems with that. We're fueling you know, these places where we're gonna have to move away from fossil fuel. Uh, we're gonna need to not have them become sacrifice zones because if they become sacrifice zones, then you get the kind of anger that we see with West Virginia, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And you are not able to move forward. So we need to invest in those communities so that we can transition in a way that is both just and equitable uh, because a lot of those places, you know, they're rural communities, they're poor communities without that industry. There are Latino and Native American communities in New Mexico. And so we need to not leave those communities behind as we transition so that we transition in a just way that we address the environmental injustice at the same time. The great thing is that's what the Biden presidency is talking about. Uh, and so I think that we're gonna see a lot of that. The real issue is how do we get that through the Senate? Um, a lot of the things we care about, we only get through the Senate if they get rid of the filibuster. So if anybody lives in West Virginia, <laughs> call your senator and tell him there's a great New York Times article about the filibuster. It's really came out in order to squash a lot of good like civil rights legislation. Uh, we need to move beyond the filibuster because that's how we actually truly start addressing this need to transition um, to cleaner industries. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Um, we have a few minutes left, so I think we'll have time for maybe one more question. Um, and I did notice the multiple questions and comments in the chat um, and also that were sent in earlier about the division in the Congress right now. And I see um, in the chat uh, a question from Lakshmi Latimer. What advice would you give to minority adolescents who are watching and experiencing the toxicity of the political climate and feel discouraged about the future direction of our country? Is to be honest about how awful it is, right? I think that's where we have to start is we have to name it and not pretend it's not as bad as it is, right? That's that accountability part. We have to name the ugliness and we have to denounce the ugliness mm -hmm. um, and, and then say, it's not enough to call it out. We then need to address it. So we need to address it. So if it's, you know, starting to pass the, the laws, like the police reform laws, the civil rights laws, strengthening all of those so that we actually start changing it. And then the other thing you say to Alan Essence is get involved um, so that we start changing who's involved, uh, who comes out to vote and who he, we respond to. Let's look at the turnout that happened um, and, and the new voters that came out. Um, and that participated and they stayed active and we are needing to respond to those now. I did a lot of doing the general, um, I got to do all these bus tours without ever leaving New Mexico. So I went to, you know, Wisconsin, you know, all over the, the country talking about as a Latina issue, environmental issues. And so I was there with young Latino activists, uh, Latinx activists. I don't use, I'm, I'm of an age where it's like Latinx, <laughs> Latino, -a, you know, it's fine. Yes. Um, so, but they're, you know, where they were like saying, this is our issue and they're involved and we're needing to respond to it. I mean, when you look at who got involved and how we were Arizona, it was Native Americans came out to vote, Latinos came out to vote. In Georgia, it was such an amazing thing about, you know, is every community that normally didn't come out was there, including, you know, the increase in uh, Black American voting, but also in some of those places, Carolyn Bordeaux, when you have her on, have her talk about the people that came out that didn't come out before. She grew the vote by like 40,000, 60,000 people that hadn't voted before, and they included Latinos in Georgia coming out again, you know, to join the increased black voter. So it's like, if we keep increasing who votes and who's active, we start changing who gets elected and what they must then do. So I think that's what I, a, a little bit of what I would say, but being really honest that it is horrible. Oh, Congresswoman, thank you so much. It's so inspiring though. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions. We didn't get to go through everyone's questions because we are uh, running out of time, but, um, but I did want to make sure to let everyone know that, um, uh, that absolutely we will be saving the chat and making sure that the Congresswoman gets to see everyone's uh, comments and questions as well. 
Um, and, and just thank you again to the Congresswoman and her staff for being with us today. Thank you so much to everyone, all the Yale organizations that, that helped with this. And also to the first gen Yale team of Lisa Chapman, Valerie Pop, Sherry Ann Morgenstern, and Nick Rondas for being behind the scenes with all of this and making everything work. Um, it's been just terrific. So thanks so much to everyone. Uh, Congresswoman, do you have any final remarks you would like to say before we end for the night? Yes, a, a couple of things. One is I have talked about um, the fact that I see my role as in many ways that listening role, right? That rebellious, that rebellious thing we can do, uh, listen, um, is, you know, I collect problems, right? That's my job is to collect problems and to collect ideas about how to solve those problems. And, and so the people who have, who encounter those problems, who have those ideas of solving those problems, you know, range from somebody working in this, you know, in, in a northern New Mexico community to, you know, or Alex working on, you know, what do we do with regards to looking at, you know, how communities develop and what we build, you know, and what is the design, you know, different people have encountered different problems. Let me know about it. I'm a resource for you. I, I want to find good problems that we can then find solutions to. So feel free to reach out. I don't have a great website now yet, but I do have a website uh, as a congressperson. And uh, go on there, sign up so that we can send you, you know, what are like we're going to be sending out weekly newsletters and stuff like that. Uh, so you can know what I'm doing. Um, uh, Kira Ellis Moore is my campaign manager. Uh, she'll, she has her, she's going to put it in the chat now to be able to contact her. Uh, I do need to get reelected. Uh, but, uh, but this idea of you are a resource to me. Um, and uh, I, I'd love for you to see me as a resource to you. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Okay, everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I think this has been terrific. Thank you again, Congresswoman. We uh, congratulate you. We're so happy for you. You make all Yaleys proud. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.